Okay, guys, it's uh, May 1st, 2018, and uh, we're lucky tonight to have Todd Bailey from Vetric. He is, uh, you're the originator from Design and Make. That was your concept that you kind of started, and now it's kind of um, owned and presented by Vetric, and they, Todd is the key person. I'll let him, uh, I'll give him control of the uh, presentation, and I'll let him give a little intro of uh, a little bit about him, and then we'll kind of get started with the presentation. So let me turn the presentation over to Todd. Okay. Let's see. Okay, can you see, what can you guys see? Okay, we can see your, we can see your whole screen. And if it's not fully enlarged in your screen, guys, Go ahead and hit your expand button on your screen, and you'll get full, and you'll get full screen. You guys should be able to see uh, just the design and make logo and my name and the little tagline. Thumbs up, everybody. Everybody got it, okay? Perfect. Looks, yeah. looks like we're on. Okay. So, okay, so Ted, you just interrupt whenever you want to, um, and I'll just kind of ramble on, and then if you just want me to flow right into my presentation, I can do that, okay? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and give a little introduction about uh, you and your company, sure, and then... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, my name's Todd, and I'm the uh, product development manager for Design and Make. Um, I've been with Design and Make for three years now, ever since it started, as Ted said. And um, it started um, a weekend project. Actually, I was looking for um, a little extra side money. So I started a little project called CNC Mini Projects. And essentially what it was was a small group of like models that you could assemble to create a larger model layout, let's say. Uh, what I really wanted to do was to allow people to experience what I experienced when I first ever cut my first part, which was something that was, I wasn't worried about the time it took me to machine it. I just wanted to take a finished part off my machine, something that I had seen just, you know, maybe a couple of hours ago that I had uh, developed in a computer and then actually physically be able to hold it in my hand. When you do that for the first time, it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. So I was hoping that maybe I could come up with a product that that would um, facilitate for other people. And so I did, and um, I uh, Vectric noticed and decided that they would like to uh, make it part of what they thought Design and Make would be. And so CNC Mini Projects and Design and Make, or excuse me, and Vector Art 3D came together and became Design and Make. Now I've been working with CNC since uh, 1999. Um, I worked at a giftware, a local giftware company uh, at the time when they were bringing in a CNC and um, they needed some way to learn it. So I raised my hand and I was the, the one picked. I um, did that for almost 10 years and then I decided to leave there and start doing custom modeling um, for just custom clients. Worked out really well. I was really happy with that. So modeling is kind of my forte, hence why I, I kind of fit well into um, the design and make world. Uh, you guys have some pretty wonderful machines. When I started out, um, I bought my first kit machine, which is a, was a Shapoko one. And um, I purchased it when it was on Kickstarter. It came in in like a thousand pieces in a box. And I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. So but two weeks later, I ended up having this machine. And it was a great experience overall, because of course I got to learn how it all worked, how it went together. Um, how I could tweak it if it didn't work well. And so that was great. That, that, I used that for uh, probably three years. And then I now use a uh, craft CNC. And um, if you know anything about design and make, that's the um, machine that we offer plans for for free that if you're in a makerspace that has a, um, a laser cutter or and a 3D printer, you can build this unit for about $600. And all the parts that I make are made on this machine with a Dremel uh, as a router, and uh, it works brilliantly, actually, really quite nicely. And um, as a uh, 
the software that I use to send the G code to the machine is a universal G code sender. I don't know if any of you, any of you guys know about that, but it works really well and it's quite nice. And uh, let me interrupt you real quick here. Uh, Don Bates, who is the guy in the bubble with the headphones on, mm -hmm. he is an original founder and uh, partner in the Kalamazoo maker space. And they have over 50 makers there. And, and I'm sure that information uh, uh, gets him going a little bit. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's amazing when you build a machine from scratch to actually, I know you guys that have built a CNC router parts machine or, or whatever it is, all the things that you learn and how you can troubleshoot your own machine. And that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. So I'm, I'm quite fortunate that the, the kit that I made my craft CNC from, of course, came from Vectric. It was already pre-cut and pre-printed and, uh, but still it was, it was, you know, things don't always fit exactly like they should. So it was fun to, to kind of put together. Yeah. So if you actually download the plans for the craft CNC, if you have a laser cutter and a 3d printer, then for about $600, you can have a pretty capable little CNC machine. It's only the, the, the actual, um, working envelope is about seven inches square, which isn't super huge, but to do things like I do, that's the perfect size for testing parts and, and uh, actually making full, full things, full projects. Um, so yeah, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more a little later. So uh, I'm not too sure how many here know about design and make. I'm assuming you all have seen a little icon in your software. Um, so I thought I, what I would do is just run through what makes us special and a little bit different and then um, go into doing um, three sort of demos that build up skills from a beginner to intermediate maybe and using design and make content and then take us into actually creating a project which could be a little hairy. I've only done it a couple times since I drew it on paper on Sunday on my flight back from South Carolina. So we're going to see how it goes and we'll see if it works out in the end. So first, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, first of all, design and make um, this, if you've ever been there to our homepage, um, it's pretty much uh, sort of a portal into what I hope people who have Vectric software will come to get inspired. We have shop notes, customer focused posts, hacks to kind of keep you inspired. We offer free software, uh, design and make machinist, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Of course, the free plans to build the craft CNC, and then a link to the design and make it store or design and make store, excuse me. And then it's just a screenshot of the actual store. So what I'm gonna do is I'll take you through a quick quick tour of the actual uh, whole site, just really quickly, nothing, I'm not gonna get too crazy about it. Um, let me just bring up another window here, sorry. So this is design, design and make. Um, we have our store button here. Of course we have, this is where I really, really what I really wanna focus on is the shop notes. If you are looking for some or inspiration on what our customers are up to, what they do with the content that we offer, you can come here and get all kinds of great inspiration. On this is James Patton. He made a wonderful um, box for his uh, his father um, with some of our military uh, content. We've got um, this is Don Harding. He made this nice quilter sign for um, for a friend and painted it up quite nicely. It looks really good in the end. Uh, I'm just going to go through a couple more here. There's those who make cribbage boards. This gentleman made a beautiful cribbage board that you can fold up and travel with using some of our content on there to kind of jazz it up, which was quite nice. So really every, every week I post a customer focus post, which again is content that one of our customers has made or, or a product or a project that a customer has made with some of our content. Also, we show off the hacks of the week. Um, a, hack of, a hack of the week is a, it's a model project, which is a group of models that you can put together to come up with, uh, for instance, this one was, was an Irish pub sign. Um, oops, I don't know what happened there. But we offer, um, this, so this is the group of models that you could purchase. It comes with an assembled layout, which is a layout that I already made that I thought you might be interested in. And then you can actually just go ahead and customize that for sale if you would like. Software, I mentioned the free software. This is our design and make machinist software. You guys obviously already have Vectric software, which is great, and thank you very much for that. Um, but if you didn't have it, or if you were a maker, just get in, all you really need to do is just cut um, 
maybe a, a recessed pattern in the top of a, of a box, or you're looking to maybe make an applique to put on a uh, top of a door or something like that, then Design and Make Machinist is a very simple program that you can cut one model at a time. You can't add any V carving, but you can just simply cut a project. And there's some videos here if you're interested in how that can be used. And also, we have a Design and Make uh, starter pack, which comes with 21 models for free. Um, and all you need to do is just essentially sign up for a Design and Make account, and then you can go ahead and download all of those. So if you don't have a Design and Make account, I really um, kind of hope that you go and do that, and we have some great free content for you to download if you would like. Um, and then, of course, there's our Craft CNC, and this is just a page that will bring you to the actual GitHub page where you can download all of the plans for the actual Craft CNC. Uh, this is just mainly just information, some projects to get you started, and so on, and things you can do, things we've done with it, which is pretty neat. Um, that's great. Let's just pop over to the store for a second. I hope some of you have been to the store. Um, we offer two, right now we offer two different things in our store, um, single models, which essentially are just that. They're single models that you can purchase. Um, they generally come in three different formats, the A style, which is positive, B style, which is in a dish, and then the C style, which is in a hand carved um, dish. Um, the B and the C obviously are made mainly to be machined into um, a piece of material you already have, like maybe it's a, um, a prefab door you've purchased, a cupboard door, or maybe it's a top of a box you've already made, or something that you want to add to an end of a crib, or you know whatever you think uh, you need it for. Typically, that you can buy them, you know, the A, B, or the C style, or if you'd like to, you can purchase the pack of them for a discounted price. And we also offer Oh, shoot, wrong button. Um, projects. And projects are groups of models that I've curated or put together. And, um, oh, it's a hack of the week. Let's not use that one. It's not a good example. Let's go with, um, yeah, Anna, what else I go? Let's go with this one here. Um, the Western Expansion Pack number one. So this is a group of models that I've put together uh, that I feel work really well together. And you get with that an assembled layout, which is an assembly or layout that I assembled during the creation of this project. So I know that all of these things kind of fit together nicely and work really well together. And I think that in most cases, somebody would use this who is interested in this particular pack of models. It comes with a project sheet, lots of information, or lots of inspiration, excuse me, um, and something you can print out. And now as a little aside, all of the project sheets can be downloaded and printed out. So if you have a small business and you're thinking about pre-selling these projects, definitely go on to Design and Make, download these, um, these project sheets and print them out. Put them in a binder, and that way you can show customers or potential customers the things that you can do before you put the money into actually buying these projects. It's odd, but I really don't want your money unless you really want to spend it. I'd much rather you, you really want the content and, and have a, a plan to get a return for that. And then also on these pages, we have food for thought layouts, just other layouts that you could potentially put together that I've put together again during the curation of these projects that I think work really well together and just want to inspire you to, to use these things. So that's a, um, a design, design and make model pack or a model project. Also in that are hacks of the week. And hacks of the week are kind of an interesting beast. I started these way back when I was doing CNC mini projects. And um, we're up to 175 of them now. And my idea was that um, I wanted to inspire people to use content that they already had or, or had already purchased and mix and match it to make brand new things. So for instance, this one here is a great hack of the week. It's number 155. It's a uh, guide services. I was surfing the web one day. Thought, wouldn't it be neat if I could you know, put together a guide services or a fishing camp sign? And so I rummaged through our clip art and found these models. Um, this one, the, the fishing fly came with, came with one of our fishing um, projects. The fish was um, already part of Vector Art 3D, so I just grabbed that. The, um, the barrel top came from a wine project, which is kind of a funny place. And this one also came from a wine project. But adding those all together, you can see how well that came together into a nice project. So if you purchase this hack of the week, you would get all of those models and then also this um, 
assembled layout that you could easily just go in and add some V carving, or if you wanted to add some other, some more of your own content to it, maybe a ribbon to it or whatever you'd like to do. So that's one of, so that's sort of the second um, model project ID. And then the third one we just started doing, and I'm gonna have to um, just quickly see if I can find it really fast. Out. You guys probably know um, Michael Tyler's free vectric projects of the month. I'm sure you've downloaded them, cut them even. And we were going through some of them a while ago and we had noticed that a lot of these free projects, the older ones especially, could be updated with design and make content. So what we started to do, or what I started to do, was I created this make it your own series of videos. So if you have the paradise box already, there's a video that will show you how to add some 3D content to the top of it. If you have this divine clock and you've already cut it, maybe it's in your library, maybe you already offer it at a craft show or wherever it happens to be, then in the video that's down the page here, you can see how I look at the, the project as Michael Tyler wanted it to originally be, and then go in and remove the bits I don't want and then add in new content. And we thought it was a reasonable idea to actually offer the models that I use as a, um, a, a model pack to sell. Now you don't need to use these. You, what I would like you to do actually is to go back, look at the divine clock or the paradise box and say, hey, I have content already that I can go ahead and I can edit this with. Why don't I just go ahead and make it my own? So anyway, so that's, that's the third sort of um, group of model project that we offer. And that's pretty much all that we have at Design and Make right now. And there's lots more to come. Now that we can do two-sided machining, um, and if you guys are familiar with some of the new stuff that's coming in version 9.5, we're heavy into the, the, the rotary stuff. So you never know what might be coming as projects for us along the way. So that's kind of exciting. So the, and the, what's in the Design and Make store? Just to kind of review that. I don't want this to be a big infomercial for Design and Make, but certainly I'd like you guys to at least know what's there. We sell all of our single models in three different styles, the A, the B, and the C style. We have model projects, which are just model projects. There's no vectors included in those. There's no tool path. It's just a collection of models. And you need to go ahead and assemble those into what you want and create your own tooling. We have Hacks of the Week. This is one of our our, um, our best sellers is Hack of the Week number 146, which is uh, this Armed Forces Strong and Free badge um, or layout. And the assembled layout for this for this is that exact layout without the V-carving on there. So you can go ahead and add in your own V-carving if you'd like. And then our latest thing is these Make It Your Own uh, model packs to help you kind of dust off those old Michael Tyler projects and, and give them a new lease on life. And the the last thing that we offer at Design and Make, and this is the biggest, you know, sort of deal that you can get from us right now, is we offer large collections. So this is a group of model projects that we've collected up along with extra models, and we sell at a discounted price. So things like the Western Scenes collections, the uh, Wildlife Scene collection, there's the Panels collection, there's the, the Dogs of the World collection, which hopefully we'll have another one of those out soon. Um, the, and hopefully it's a little teaser for you guys. The next few months we're going to have out the African Wildlife Series uh, or collection coming out. So that should be out the next couple months. So I'm going to now, if you have any questions, I don't, I don't know if you do or not. You certainly can ask them. No, I'm going to get a drink then. Yeah, I'm going to go into some really, oh, go ahead, Ted. Well, I was just going to ask, um, you know, your hacks of the week. Uh, are those sold as a package? I always thought it, they were just examples of what other people did. No, no. Originally, they were uh, not sold as uh, they were just a list of models um, and where I got them from. And then we had people actually start asking for these, the packs of models or the assembled layout that we had come up with. And um, we decided that we may as well try and sell them. So the, so the hacks of the week all sell for $35 a piece. You generally get four to five models. You get the assembled layout, and then you get um, the project sheet that's special for that project. Okay. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. 
that, and it's only I think we I started doing that um, back on like uh, 144 or something like that. So the ones previous to that um, are 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 just um, like I said, just lists of models, but hopefully at some point I'll get the time to be able to turn those into proper projects. Nice. So you guys have been using Vectric software for a while, so I'm hoping I'm not going to bore you with these uh, these few demos that I'm going to do. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to pick up a few little tidbits along the way. Um, so let's start off with my first one, which and this is going to build up from being very basic for the new user to something a little bit more just you know, for the medium guy or people that you know they're just sort of tinkering around with 3d content so the first little demo i'm going to do is going to be, i'm going to take one single model uh, and the b style model and show you how to essentially just take that and machine it into a piece of wood piece of material the piece of material could be the top of a box you already have could be the end of a workbench you know it could be almost anything but for this little demo we're just going to make it into uh, a, a um, sort of coaster sized thing. Now I'm going to show, I'm going to, all of these demos I'm going to do in vCarve desktop. Um, all the tools that I'm going to use are available in Pro and Aspire. And, and with respect to this particular demo, if you had Design and Make Machinist, then you could do this one as well in it if you wanted to with a few little tweaks. I'm not going to get into those tweaks with Machinist, but um, uh, it, you can do it. Okay, so here we go. I am actually going to go and minimize this if I can figure out how to do that. And minimize this. Let's go ahead and bring up vCarve Desktop. And I have some cheat sheets here. It's only really not a cheat sheet, it's just so that I can keep track of where I'm going. I'm not one to write down um, numbers and so on. I like to work very organically, like I think most of our users do. Um, I'm not one to type in a bunch of numbers because that just that just kind of takes away from the whole thing. Let's create a brand new file. And it's going to be a single-sided job, not double-sided. Later on, I'll get into a double-sided job if you guys haven't experienced that. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and start this off with uh, a 7x7 seven seven piece of material. Again, this could be doesn't need to be 7x7, seven seven, but it could be whatever you want it to be. We're going to make the thickness of this is going to be about, um, I think I have 0 0.5, 0 point, yeah, 0 0.5 an inch. That's great. Let's put that away now. I don't need that anymore. Okay, and we're going to click OK. I always have my datum set in the center. Of course, you, you'll need to adjust that based on your comfort with your machine. I'm not sure where you want to start, but I like to start in the middle. Very high resolution always with all of my projects. Um, I never go any lower than that. And we're going to click OK. I'm going to go over to my clip art tab and I've already downloaded the piece of clip art I want to use and the way that I, I um, keep my own personal um, single models I don't know if you, if you purchase a design and make project it's delivered to you as an installer so when you double click on it it automatically um, it takes all of the content that you've purchased and plunks it into your default vector clip art library which is brilliant works every time it's lovely if you purchase a single model doesn't work quite that clean. What happens is it download it gets downloaded to your downloads folder, and you have to put it someplace where you can find it. What I've done is I've created in my vector default clip art library a folder called 01 single models. And every time I download a single model, I drag it into that folder and then it shows up automatically inside my software. Um, if you ever if you're interested in knowing how I do that, just you can just fire me off an email and I can certainly show you step by step how to do that. That's not a big deal. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in this uh, mechanics wrench in hand, which works pretty nice. Now I'm going to do my total, my, my full layout in the 2D view. Um, some people like to work fully in the 3D, and, and I do normally work a lot in the 3D, but I'm going to stick to the 2D just so we can get our layout proper and everything. So we're just going to size this to fit my space. That looks great. And then I'm going to draw a simple rectangle around this. Nothing too fancy. It really doesn't matter the size of it really in the end. We're just uh, holding down my Alt key and my Shift key. I can, or my Control key, excuse me. I can make one about the right size, just sort of eyeballing that in. Let's radius those corners a bit, maybe a quarter inch. And we'll hit Apply. And that's great. There's my little sign I'm going to make. Not complicated at all. Now, my top tip for this is going to be 
that when I machine this, I'm only going to machine the dish. I'm only going to cut that. I'm going to do a roughing pass and a finishing pass. But what vector or what sorry what vcarve will do is if I tell it to only machine up to the up to the edge of my model, because there's nothing out here for it to see, it actually could drop off the edge of my model in theory. It could do that. So if I was using a very small cutter, it could actually make little divots all around my model. And I'll show you why it does that. If I take, if I select this component and I go to my modeling tab and I create a, a vector boundary from that component, and then I zoom in really tight. I don't know if you can see this or not, but you'll see where the line was created, but there's a little hole here. If my tool was super small, it would fall in there. So if I was using like a, a 1 16th or something like that, I'd actually put little divots in there if I was using this vector boundary as my, uh, my limit to my tooling. So to stop that from doing that, all you need to do is just add in a zero plane. And so we've actually given it something there now to run onto and it won't fall off the edge of my model. Again, that may only happen if you're using a really, really small cutter. But it does happen, and I've seen people have that happen before, and they didn't realize why. So we're going to put that zero plane in there, which is great. And seeing as I've already gone ahead and made that vector, I'm going to use that as my boundary to create my uh, my tooling from. Now, as I'm sure you all know, that if if I had two models there or two components, I would need to create a different kind of vector. But I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Let's bring up our toolpath tab and flip to our 3D view. Now, the thing that I haven't done is I haven't checked the depth or the shape height of my actual uh, hand and wrench thing, mechanics wrench. So I'm gonna select that and take a look at my properties for that. My material is a, is a half inch thick, so I could probably go down to 0.3, maybe 0.35, and still I would, I would have lots of lots of material left underneath the lowest point so I wouldn't actually machine through my part or it wouldn't get too thin. So that's great. I think that looks pretty nice. I'm happy with that. But another little thing too, you'll notice that this has been this is kind of grayed out. It looks kind of milky. That's because if I go up to my view, you'll see that I've got my model modeling plane turned on. If I turn that off, then everything looks normal again. That's only there so that I can I know when something drops below my my modeling plane into the negative, but I want it to be in the negative, so I, I understand why that's there. Let's quickly go ahead and set up our material. It's a half inch piece of material, my datum is set to the center. I'm gonna zero off the top of my, my board, which is great. I have a lot of customers, that, at least new customers, that will email me and say, you know what, I, I, for whatever reason, it's, it's, it's cutting into my material before uh, it actually hits my relief way more than I want to. And that's because they didn't bother to to fix the model position in their material. You guys probably all know this, but the light brown area is your actual model and the dark brown area is the extra material you have. So in this case, I want to jam my model all the way to the top of my board. I want to make sure my gap, this, the remainder of that is underneath my my model. And if you look at the actual 3D view, you can see that VCarve has got a little ghost box here of my material, so I can see my, what my material looks like. And as you can see, my model's pushed to the top, and I have a little bit of a gap at the bottom, which is perfect, exactly what I want. And of course, you set these based on your machine at the bottom. Just click OK. Quickly do our tooling. We're going to do a roughing pass. I'm going to tile my view. That way I can see both. I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill. Uh, I'm going to use a selected vector, so I'm going to choose this vector. Now, if I chose model boundary, it would, in the background, um, VCarve would make that same vector you see here. So it really doesn't matter much, but it does matter to me if I had more than one model there or I wanted to have control over that. So I like to use this vector. I'm going to do that. I'm going to have no boundary offset. I don't want my tool to go outside that dish any. I want it to stay inside the dish. I'm going to set my machining allowance of 0 0.02, so I'm going to have a little skin of material over that that I can remove during my finishing. I like to use a 3D raster in these demos uh, only because the Z-level roughing doesn't always show what I want people to see, but if your machine can do the Z-level roughing, then go for it. It's faster. Calculate that. Now, as always, you should preview your tooling across the board when you make it. Save yourself a whole lot of hassle. If, if it doesn't look right in the software, 100% chance it's not going to look right in your machine. Let's just take a look at that. 
that's what I was hoping to see. Looks pretty good. Now, one thing I'm not going to show you, and you're going to you're going to notice this, is I'm not optimizing this tooling at all. I'm using the settings that they've got in there. Um, again, I want I'm trying to show people how to get their first part off their machine or the second part off their machine successfully. And those people are not worried about whether it takes 20 minutes or two hours to cut apart. They just want to cut a part that looks good and they can work with it. Let's just go ahead and do our finishing. I'm going to use a 16th inch ball nose end mill. I didn't have one in my tool library, so I had to do it myself. Um, and actually, you know what? I'm, I'm going to change that. Let's go ahead. Let's just try a uh, an 8th inch ball nose end mill for the fun of it. Uh, and we are going to use my selected vector. I already have selected, no boundary offset. I'm going to use offset tooling. Again, not again, but offset tooling I like to use when I'm using when something's round or oval. That way my, my tooling marks will follow the shape of it, which is always nice. And if you don't get it totally cleaned up, it looks like it belongs there. I'm going to use a step over retract. And hopefully you guys have tried that before when you're machining 3D stuff, especially in the, or the, you can only use that in the offset tooling. What happens is when you're, tool does one or when your g-code tells your machine to do one circle normally what it does is it just slides over to the next circle and does the next one over next one over well that that motion of moving to the next circle will actually leave sometimes leave a little ghost line behind a little dwell mark there that's left behind as you move across if you use a step over retract what will happen is it'll finish the circle it'll lift up slightly move over go back down again and do the next one and you don't get that that um, that radial line that you see quite often. Let's calculate that. It'll take a second. Sorry. And let's preview that visible toolpath. It's great. I didn't need that 1 16th after all. I'm happy with that. It's great. The last tooling we're going to do, or the last toolpath we're going to do, is a profile cut just so we can cut this out. Now, if you were using uh, Design and Make Machinist, this is the thing you can't do. You can tell it to cut, uh, do a cutout pass, but what it will do is in this case, with this model, it would cut it out in a circle, which isn't really what we're looking for. So if you were using Design and Make Machinist, I would suggest that you actually have a piece of material cut to the right size or cut it afterwards on one of your other tools, like a chop saw or whatever you have. We're going to use a uh, start depth of zero, cut depth of 0.5. We're going to use an end mill. That's all good. Out, so we're going to cut outside of our line. Perfect. We're not going to bother with a separate last pass. We'll add in some quick tabs. On my machine, I don't use tabs. It's, it's, the, it's the craft CNC. Double-sided tape works brilliantly. Don't need to worry about this at all. But I'm going to add in tabs in this case. Add in four tabs. Add those tabs. And VCarve Desktop tries to do its best to put those where they belong, but I like to put them on the straightaways. That way they're easy to remove. Close that down. Just go ahead and calculate that. Preview our visible toolpath. And there we have. It's a simple little sign for your shop, not complicated, really easy to do. Doesn't take long to tool. Shouldn't take too long to cut. Um, and using one model from the Design and Make store. Now, you guys know that you get tons of content or tons of clip art free with your software. So a lot of these models in here are just ripe for doing something like with this with. Or um, again, if you set up a Design and Make account, there's some free content there for you waiting that you can do this with. Let's close that down and go back to PowerPoint. And let's just hit play. So there we go. That's the first of the demos. You guys, glad you sat through that. I know it's pretty basic stuff, but I did, essentially what I showed you to do was to add a model to a job, size it right, get the shape height right, um, create a vector outline of the model, explain a bit of why you add that zero plane in there, uh, and then create some basic tooling for that, which is pretty easy. Okay. So now I talked briefly before about the assembled layout. So every project that you get comes along with an assembled layout. In the case of the Pops Tool Shop number two, this is the assembled layout that you get, which is a lovely sign with the, the hand uh, planer in there and a space for you to uh, add some customization if you'd like. 
So I'm going to show you how to use it, how to, how to add a little bit of customization to this, and then cut it, which is, again, stuff you've already seen a second ago, most of it, but some of it will be new. Let's just jump over to um, some software. Again, like I mentioned before, this can be done in vCurve Pro or Desktop. I'm going to show you in Desktop. It can be done in Aspire. And um, the V carving can't be done in Machinist, although you can cut this sign in Machinist or Design and Make Machinist, but you couldn't do the V carving. So you'd have to go back in and have somebody who could paint it on or some other method add that text on there for you. Great. So let's just jump back over to our software here. We're going to start a brand new clean V carve desktop. Create a brand new file. I'm going to go back to my cheat sheet just for a second so I get the dimensions right. Okay, so we're going to start a new single sided job. The width is going to be 22 and we're going to go 16 high. And we're going to cut this out of a one inch piece of material. Inches, again, same as before. Everything's set the same. We're going to click OK. Let's go to our clip art tab. Now, if you've purchased and installed the Pops uh, Tool Shop number two, it'll show up right in your default vector clip art library, and you can go directly to the Pops Tool Shop number two, and you'll see all the models that you get are all there to create your own layout with if you'd like, if you're not interested in the, using the assembly, or you can go ahead and double click on the assembly and it will arrive in your job. So I want to hold down my shift key and just drag this up to fit. I'm not too worried about the size as long as it fits in my, my job. Looks great. Wasn't too bad. And let's go ahead and lay out some text. We're going to type in some text and we're going to type in Michigan, M-I-C-H-I-G-A-N, Michigan, and then makers. And we are going to use the one of my favorite fonts for V carving, which is Candera right here. And we're going to hit apply. We make sure we bold that up and apply. Close that, and there it is right there. So we're going to size that up. Now a couple of little things. One is that if I click this uh, component. You'll see that it, it darkens it down, changes the uh, the contrast of it, and I can see where the center of this board is. So I want to put Michigan on the top and Makers on the bottom. But as soon as I click Michigan, it switches back again to be faded slightly. If I select that component, right-click on it, and go down to Object Properties, I get this little slider here. So I can go ahead and slide that fading off. So now I can see the model is always going to be there for me in full contrast without it being faded so I can see all of its details. But the bad thing about this is that it always looks like it's selected. So you need to make sure that you know when it's selected and when it's not. And the way you can tell, of course, if, is if you double click it, you can see the control handles and you know that that's selected or in your modeling tab, you can tell that it's been selected because it's blue. Just to keep that in mind. But I still need to see that so when I actually select my text, I can line it up properly. So this is two lines of text. That's great and all. I could have actually created two lines on its own, but I, I didn't want to do that in two steps. So I'm going to right click on my text and I'm going to break that text into two lines, which is pretty easy to do. And now I've got two lines of text and now I can go ahead and place those on my sign where I think they belong. So I'm going to select those again, just shift select them and size them down a bit. Just going to eyeball those in a little bit better. Now let's just go ahead and move that text onto here. Let's just rotate that around. I'm using my cursor keys just to kind of nudge it into place where I want it to be. And then if I go to my drawing tab, I'm going to go ahead and use this tool right here, Edit Text Spacing and Curve. If I click it, I'll get these two new green handles that show up. And I can easily just simply just kind of pull that up a bit so that it fits on that curve a little bit better. That works okay, very fast to do. I'm gonna do the same thing with the makers, move it up to where it belongs, rotate it around. Oh, should I have to go back to my pick tool? Ro rotate that around, place that on that line there. 
use my cursor keys to nudge it into place. Pretty decent. Let's go ahead and use those green guys again. And I can now lay that text on there fairly quickly. And that looks pretty good for V carving. And it's an old rustic sign, so whether it's perfect, I'm really not too worried about it as long as it's on there. That looks great. So let's just go ahead now and create some tooling for this. Tile our windows and bring out our toolpaths tab. If, you, if this happens to me quite often is I'll tile it before I bring out my toolpaths tab and I lose, I don't know, maybe it's just the designer in me. I can't see the edge of my windows here. So if I just click that again, it will fix it back up for me and, and center it all up again. Which is great. Let's just go ahead now and create some tooling. We're going to go ahead and set our material. So it's one inch thick. That's great. Data set to the center. I'm going to zero off the top of my block. And again, I'm going to point this out that make sure that your model is where you want it to be inside your material. Our gaps at the bottom. And I have underneath the lowest point on my job, point one nine plus whatever is here. So these little legs here are going to be going to be thick enough, I think, to, to, to be able to survive. If I wanted them to be a little thicker, then I could go ahead and decrease the shape height of my model, and I'd be good to go. I'll click OK. Do a quick roughing pass. Now, again, I'm going to use my selected vector for that. So I need to get a vector. And here's a perfect example. I think that my model has been selected, but it's not. So let's go ahead and fix that uh, fading. Let's right click on that. Go to my object properties, set that back to the middle, press close, and now I'll know for sure if I have it selected. Go to my modeling tab, get a vector to isolate my tooling, which is great. Selected boundary, I'm going to use my quarter inch end mill. I'm going to use a boundary offset. I always like to set my offset to be equal to the, the size of my tool. In this case, we'll do the Z level roughing. And we're going to calculate that. And we're going to preview our visible toolpath. And that's exactly what I expected to see. So I'm happy with that. Close that down. Do a finishing pass. I'm going to use a, I'll use my 1 8 inch ball nose. That's fine. Selected vector. It's still selected. So that's great. Boundary offset 0.125. We're going to use a raster instead not an offset. I don't want to start in the middle and work my way out because I'll get those weird, I, I, could, I could get those weird radial things going on. I don't want that. And plus, any kind of tooling going back and forth on these boards will look right. And we'll go ahead and calculate that. That will take a minute to calculate. Let's preview that toolpath. Cleans up really nice. I like that a lot. Looks really, really good. To close that, let's just go ahead and select our text and do our V carving. Now we're not going to give it a start height or a flat bottom. I don't want to worry about that um, because I'm going to use the feature at the bottom called pro project toolpath onto my 3D model. Luckily, these are flat, but if they were ribbons that were contoured at all, I'd want it to develop the tooling for the V carving and then project it onto the 3D model that's underneath it. Um, and in this case, I'm going to do it anyway, but it's flat, but we're going to use it anyway. I'm going to use a 90 degree V bit. Use whatever's more comfortable for you. Let's preview that tool path. Looks really good. We're going to go ahead and do our profile cut. Now, what we can do here is we're going to we can do a little bit of math inside of our actual boxes here to to help us figure out the, the proper combination of start depth and cut depth. Normally, I would have gone just to make my life a whole lot easier and change the shape height of this to be an even number. So this math would be easier, but I didn't do that. So we need to go find out what the, the actual shape height of this is. We're going to go look at our component properties. It's 0.8061. So we're going to just kind of copy that. 
and close that down. And over here, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to put some numbers in here. So our start depth is going to be at the base of that because I've cleaned up right down to that board, quarter inch width, it's happy. But what I want is to know how deep I need to go. So if I put in 0.75, press minus on my keyboard, my keypad, paste in that number, and then press equals on my keyboard, it will do the math for me in there. Oh, shoot, I did something wrong there. Uh, one inch, sorry, one inch, isn't it? Not that, minus that equals, there we go, sorry. So the balance of that is 0.1939, which is a silly number. But those added together will give me the thickness of my material, which is great. So you can do that actually in a lot of the different um, uh, forms and so on. You can do math right in there, which is really handy if you need to do some quick math. We'll use our, our end mill that we used before. We're going to cut outside that line. We'll add in some tabs because this would be way big to use double-sided tape to hold down. We'll add in six tabs, should be okay. Add those tabs, oh shoot, didn't have a vector selected. All right, let's just go get that vector and let's add those tabs again. Add tabs, there we go. And move those to somewhere that's convenient. That's not gonna cause me too much grief when I have to cut them off. Over there, one there. This guy's not in a good spot. That's pretty good. Maybe we'll move him down a bit. We'll close that down and we'll calculate that tooling. We'll preview our visible tool path. And there we have the finished sign ready to go. That was pretty quick and easy. Not so bad, just adding using the already assembled layout and adding on some V carving. So that's example number two. Go back to the PowerPoint for a sec. Let's play. Okay, so we use the, just like I said, we, have, we use the assembled layout, we added a model to the job, we size, I didn't size it to the, the, the right height that I wanted, and that caused me the problem with having that odd number, but normally I would have taken it and changed it to a nice even number so it would work better. Created a little text for V carving. Um, we did the vector outline of the model, and then we created some really basic tooling for that. So that works out pretty good. And you can see how, you know, your return on, on investment on this particular project, if you use this sign over and over again, you could use it for all kinds of different jobs. So for 35 bucks, it's a pretty good deal in the end. And this one here, we're going to actually develop a layout from scratch. So as I said before, model projects are exactly that. They're a group of models that I think can be used to create a bunch of different layouts. In this case, this is Dad's Garage number two, and um, you get this, this group of models. This is the assembled layout, and then you get this nice project sheet that gives you some other sort of inspiration so that you can you know, come back to this project over and over again and try different things. So what I'm gonna show you how to do is actually recreate this CHOPS classic custom sign. Um, instead of just using the assembled layout and just adding some basic V carving, which you guys, I just showed you how to do and you guys, I'm pretty sure I know how to do already. We're gonna go ahead and lay this out using some really basic features of the software. Tilt and then merge in your components. What I like to do when I'm creating these projects is make them so that you only need to use add, subtract, merge, and then tilt and fade. And all the other stuff you can learn later on as time goes on, but that's all you need to kind of get started. Let's just go ahead and do that. This example, again, I'm gonna do in VCarve Desktop. It could be in Pro or Aspire, but you cannot do this in Machinist. Machinist can only cut one model at a time. So unless you had a way to purchase the STLs of this project, put them together to create one solid STL and then bring that into, oh, even then you couldn't do it because Machinist can only open up um, B3M files. So you're out of luck. So Machinist, this isn't gonna work for you guys. But I don't think any of you need to worry about that because you probably don't have Machinist. Let's just go back into VCarve Desktop and let's start this layout. Use my cheat sheet for a second just to get me started. Let's create a brand new file. In this particular case, it's gonna be 10 inches by 
12 inches, and we're going to use a 3 quarter inch piece of material. All this other stuff is the same setup I had before. Nothing's changed. Press OK. Go to my clip art tab. Go and look for my pocket. might want to check your settings again. You said 3 quarter inch piece of material. Did I goof up? I did. Look at that. Thank you very much, Ted. That's great. You're paying attention. I did it on purpose, by the way, just to <laughs> test you. That was all. <laughs> Good. Okay, so that's perfect. Thank you very much for that. So let's go to my clip art tab and let's go find um, Dad's Garage number two. So here we have all of our models have all been installed correctly because I ran the installer and everything's happy. I'm going to start out with our garage sign and I don't have any of these dimensions written down, so we're just going to wing this. So I'm going to size this up. When I grab that control handle and I hold down my shift key, I can drag it up and make it as big as I want. I'm just eyeballing that to make sure I have enough room around it to fit my tool, which is great. I'm going to do everything in the 2D view to start with, just so I get my layout right. Double click on my car, and I'm just going to grab you and pull you down to here. I've got a picture of it beside me, just so I can kind of um, get the size right. Just I, I don't have the numbers, just the, just eyeballing it in there. That's great. Just curious, you know what kind of car that is? Uh, no, I have no idea. Vintage. <laughs> I think yeah. I. I stuck, the one thing I try not to do is make things exact. I don't want to try and when I modeled that, I didn't want to be too exact to any model. Yeah, that no, looks great. So, Keep going. Just, just a generic one. Just bring in a tire. I'm going to position the tire where I want it to be. Scale that down. Put that in there. Just kind of nudge that up a little bit and over a bit. I want it to hang over the edge of my, my thing there. That looks perfect. And let's bring in the garage sign, and we're going to put it down here at the bottom, size it down so we can put a year maybe in there that I started my garage. That's all we need to start with. Now, I haven't looked at the 3D view yet, so let's have a peek at that. And I have a feeling it's going to be a mess, and it's a mess. So we're going to go ahead now and work through how I would fix this whole um, look here. I'm not going to worry about how thick this gets. I just want it to look right, um, make sure all the elements work together well, and then I'll go ahead and, and group it all together and then change the shape height of the group to get it the right um, thickness to fit in my material. So right now this is totally just making sure everything works. And my rule of thumb is, is that I want to get the most bang for my buck out of my material thickness. So I, so it's like the eagle on your coins or whatever, you, you know, your American coins, that everything fits in that really small relief. But if you went and scaled that up, then as you scale it up, things get kind of weird. So, but they wanted to get all the most relief they could in that really small space. And that's what I want to do. I want to make sure I get enough detail in that small space that I can. So the first thing I want to work on is this wheel. If I can get it positioned correctly, then I can move everything up to where it needs to be. So as you, bo as everybody knows, I think here, there's a couple different ways that we can go ahead and change um, the properties of this component. We can either use the spanner over here. If I click this, any of these um, settings here pertain to, they work in the 2D view. Of course, they'll adjust my 3D view, but I can't go and select tilt and drop my anchor points in the 3D view from this dialog box. It won't let me, I have to do it in the 2D view. I prefer to do this right in the 3D view. So if I select this component, put an extra little blue handle down here at the bottom. If I select that, it's gonna bring up my floating properties dialog for this component. And I can, what I change here will affect the, what is done in the 3D view. It affects both, but it, it, mostly the 3D view is where I'm gonna be working. So let's just go ahead and tilt this wheel. If I click the tilt button, what it's going to ask me to do when I hit the set button is to drop in two anchor points. One anchor point, nothing is going to happen. And the other anchor point, I'm going to add a virtual wedge underneath my wheel and it's going to slowly tilt it up. So I want to slowly tilt that up until it peaks up over top of this, this, um, this ridge here on this, this frame I have. This, uh, I guess it's called the uh, Red sign. So we'll just start off by adding in some numbers. 1%. Is that going to do it? No, let's go with 5%. Is that going to work? Now we're getting there. Let's go with 8. 
pretty close. It's still kind of peeking into my tire a bit. Let's just go all the way to nine. Oh, I think I want to need 10. You can see where, if you zoom in on these uh, models, there's little green areas that show up. And that's where your model is still inside of another model. It's merged in, it's sharing that space with another component. Let's just change this to 10. And I'm almost pretty happy with that. A little bit at the bottom here, that's not quite right. I could try like 0.5. Most people wouldn't notice that if I cut it. And when I turn it up on its edge, the one thing I do want to make sure is that there's enough definition here so when my tool comes along, it actually has to go up a little bit so that I get a little step there. So when I'm finishing this, I'll be able to, uh, it'll keep some stain in there or you know stuff like that. It'll make it, make it better. I'm really happy with that. Now I need to go ahead and fix my car. My car is now still merged in with my tire. So if I, so if I double click on that, you'll see that the information in the floating properties dialog has changed to match my car. I'm happy with the shape height right now. I just want to bump it up, give it more of a base to kind of push it through so that this green stuff isn't showing anymore. Let's just start off with um, point uh, two of an inch. That looks pretty good. That was a total fluke, by the way. And you can see that where the, where the fender is, it raises up above my wheel a bit. That all looks really good. So I'm, you know, I'm just gonna stay with that the way it is. That looks great. But I also wanna make sure that, I, like I said before, I'm getting the best bang out of my model, my material thickness. So right now, the proudest part of this layout is this tire. I may as well make the front of this car as high as that tire is, so I'm gonna get that extra detail in there. It just makes sense to me, why waste it? And why waste that wood that I wanna shave off there? There might be a reason, but I'm not gonna worry about that right now. So let's just go ahead and change this to maybe point, uh, four, five maybe. If I turned up on its edge, that looks pretty good. It's a little lower than my wheel, but you know that's all right, maybe make it five, six. I'm gonna be happy with that. Okay, next top tip for you. I wanna go ahead and copy this across my model. I want another wheel over there. You can close down this floating properties dialog box. If I select my wheel and I hit the H key on my keyboard, it's gonna flip it horizontal. Okay, that's easy, right? No problem, H is for horizontal, flips it horizontal. If I hold down my shift key and press H, it flips, flips it across the center point horizontally across my, my layout, which is great. Not exactly what I want. But if I hold down the shift and the control key, control tells it to make a copy of it, and then hit my H key, it will make a copy of that across my model, or across my layout, and there I've got my copy over there. Now also, something to think about, if I wanted to get really fancy, I could also use the, the new level uh, mirror mode in the levels, which I'm, I'm not gonna show you, but that's something you might wanna look into down the road, which would allow me to create a level that was mirrored, always mirrored all the time. If I could put this tire on its own level, created a, 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 um, a mirrored level, and then it would automatically flip it over there for me. But in this particular layer, I don't need to worry about that. That worked out quite well. So that's great. And the last thing I want to fix is this little bit at the bottom here. I think I want to give it a little bit more depth, so a little more shape height and give it a little bit of a base height. So we'll select that, go back into my floating properties dialog, and let's just go ahead and give it a little bit more shape, 0.13 maybe, give it a base height of maybe 0.05. Just kind of push that up a little bit. That's kind of nice. I think that looks good. A little bit more. Okay, so I have a question. Go so, so you adjusted the shape height and the base height. Yes. The base height is the the total thickness of the wood. No, the base height is is essentially what you're taking. That when I bring in a in a in a model um, or a component straight from the clip art library, whatever you see is the shape height. Okay, and you can adjust the shape height. You can pull the Z up and down of that, that particular relief model, and you can distort it up and down as much as you want. But so your height, Z is on the bottom. 
your Z started out on the bottom. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Fair enough. Yeah, exactly. No, that's fair. Yeah. And what I'm doing with the base height is you're actually adding material to the back of it. And I can show you that. It's just a, it's a good question. Let me just minimize all this, all of this, and bring up a new job. Just, it doesn't matter what the size of it is. I don't care. We're not worried about that. Let's just go ahead to our clip art library, hit, hit our 3D view, and let's go to our, pick up any of this. Let's grab this eagle here. So that is the shape height. What you see right there is the shape height. Okay, there's nothing added to it, it's just what it is. So I can change the shape height up and down all I want for days. It's gonna get distorted because it's a relief, it looks kind of funny. But what if I want to add a bit of material behind that, solid chunk of material that takes on the shape of this whole eagle? I can add a bit of base height. I'm gonna exaggerate it by putting in like 0.5 of an inch. But really, I'm just adding material to the back of that. Perfect. It's really handy, it's really handy if, if you have a, like that, that board sign that we had with that I made the Michigan uh, Maker sign out of, and I wanted this to sit on top of that, um, that sign, but it had that little uh, V-carving cut in it there. If mm -hmm. I added this to that, then what would happen is I would get that V-carving cut showing through my model. But if I merged this eagle into that, added a base height to it equal to the height of that um, that part of the sign, then I wouldn't have that little thing showing through. It wouldn't be there. Does that kind of make sense? Yep. It's perfect. Cool. Okay, I'll minimize that and see if I can. That was a good explanation of how that is. So there we are. So that works out well. And in some cases like this, I didn't want, in order to get this, this, um, this little element high enough, I didn't want to pull the shape height to get it there because it would look really bad along with this edge would get really, really thin. So adding a combination of base height and shape height to it, I can come up with a happy medium where everything will kind of work out nicely. So I'm happy with that layout, except for I have no idea what the total, what the total shape height of this is or how thick this layout is. So let's just go ahead and take a look over here at my scale, the Z height of the model. Let's just click that. And it tells me right off the bat that I have, it's 0.66, the total shape height of this, which is fine. It fits inside my material, but the problem with that is if I'm, if I'm gonna add any V carving to this back here, it's gonna get really thin, or it may even cut through my board. So I need to change this a bit. So I'm gonna set the exact height of this model to be a number. I'm gonna put in 0.55 of an inch, apply. And that's gonna change all of the shape heights and all of the base heights. It's gonna scale it all. So everything hasn't moved. It's just scaled it all together. Close that down and now it fits in there. And I haven't lost anything. Everything still looks good. I like the relief going on there. Nothing's too muted. Everything's very happy. And we're gonna close, we're gonna hit okay. Leave that the way it is. Okay, now let's just go ahead and lay out our V carving we're gonna do next. I'm just gonna go ahead and just focus on the 2D view, press F on my keyboard to focus in on that, that job, press F on the keyboard, go to my drawing tab, and I'm gonna take a little drink, sorry. Okay, let's lay out some text. Go to my text tool, and we're going to type in chops, classic, customs. Perfect. And we're going to choose a font. I'm going to choose um, a nice blocky font. And the one I chose was going to be um, Pumist 77, whatever, whatever, whatever. And we're going to hit bold and apply. That looks great. Let's close that. And I'm going to select that text. And using my cursor keys, I'm just going to nudge it up into place. Scale that up a bit. And again, I'm going to break this up into its lines of text. I'm going to take this top bit and I'm going to size it up to be just about like that. Nudge it up a little bit. I want the C and the S to be a little bigger. I want it to kind of give a little bit more oomph to it. Let's right click on that. We're gonna convert that to curves. Then I can grab the 
C and the S together. To scale those up a little bit. Then I'm gonna nudge those back into place where they belong, first going horizontally, making sure that my spacing is still kind of correct. Then shift selecting both of those and nudging them down. Looks pretty good. Now because of the nature of this font and the way the words are, I need to kind of do a little bit more messing around here. Holding down my shift key, I'm gonna grab both of those, scale it down a little bit. Nudge this guy up. Let's grab all that text, bring it down, right click, and let's group that all up. And I'm pretty happy with that. That's pretty decent, I think. Next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of text down here to the this little circle. And I think that uh, Chops must have started his shop back in 1975. Hit apply, close that. Again, using my cursor keys, I'm just gonna nudge it down, scale that up. There we have it. I think that looks pretty nice. I'm happy with that text layout. Let's go ahead and make some tooling. Let's go ahead and um, give us a split view. Yeah, let's click it again. Let's pin this down and click that again so it fixes that little weirdness I don't like. And let's start. So I know that I'm, al I'm already going to want to use a, a vector outline to cut this out with for a profile cut. So let's just go ahead and get that to start with. So we're going to select all the components that make up the outside border of this layout. Holding down my shift key, I've got this back piece already selected. Grab this wheel, grab this other wheel, go to my modeling tab, and then create a vector boundary around selected components. So now I have this purple vector that I'm happy with, that I can cut around. Everything's gonna be happy. Start off with our material. Let's make sure that we've got this working fine. So the thickness is 0.75, everything looks great. I'm gonna double check this, my favorite little spot here to look at. Make sure my gap is below the model. So this will tell me too that I have about 0.2, almost a quarter inch of material behind the lowest spot of this job. And I know that that's gonna be in this area here. So I'm hoping that my V carving won't poke through that or won't um, you know, hurt the job any. Uh, if it does, I may either need to back it or I might need to use a, um, a flat bottom to my V carving to stop that from happening. And all this is fine, let's just click OK. Start, start off with our roughing. There's a quarter inch end mill. It's the same stuff you saw me do before. Nothing's gonna change. Everything looks great. We're gonna calculate that. Preview that visible tool path. And that looks perfect. So what I expected to have happen. Looks nice. Let's close that. Do our finishing pass. We are going to use uh, the 1 8 inch bonus end mill again. And selected vector. We're going to use a raster. It's all the same. Let's calculate that up. I have like one set of tools I like to use. So I don't know if you guys have the same or not, but I've got a pretty standard set of tools for doing 3D stuff with. The collet on my machine is only uh, an eighth inch collet, so you guys probably are in better shape for tools than I am. Let's preview that. I think that looks really nice. I'm really happy with that. Cleaned up quite nice. Let's close that. Next thing we're gonna do is gonna be our V carving. Let's select the V carving here. And we're not we're not gonna worry about the flat bottom right now. We're gonna see if this is going to, if, we, if we're gonna have anything weird going on. Make sure we project this onto our 3D model and I'm just gonna use the V bit that I happen to have here. So use whatever you have in your arsenal of tools. Let's preview that. I didn't go through my material, so that's nice. Got pretty close though, I'm sure but it's pretty good. Close that. Let's do a quick profile cut. Now, I forget what I set that to. It was 0.55, right? Okay, so 0 0.5, I think it was 0.55. Nope, yep, cancel. Good. 0.55 is gonna be my start height. I'm gonna take my 0.75, subtract my 0.55, get my the balance of that, which is 0.2. It's pretty easy math. I should have been able to do that. 
Can use my end mill outside that. Again, same thing we've been doing. Add some tabs in there. Oh, need my vector. We'll add in one, two, three, four, five. Maybe we'll add in five tabs this time. Should be lots. Leave that guy there. Bring him around there. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you double click on a tab, it will delete it. If you double click again, it'll add one in. So even if I only, if I've told it to put in six, I can add more if I want to, if I feel I need it just on the fly. It's great. Close that down, calculate that, preview that visible tool path. And there we have our custom chops classic custom sign. Added some great depth, depth to it by tucking those wheels in behind it. Having that car there, that's, I think that's a pretty, pretty top drawer sign in the end. Let's go back to my PowerPoint thing. So this was the assembled layout demo. This is what we ended up with in the end. Pretty easy to do. We created the layout. We adjusted it to fit in our material. And really, we, when we created that layout, we just used the simple tilt feature to get everything to work out nicely. We did that little demo about the, um, the shape height, which was great, and the base height. Created some vector outlines, did some tooling, and that was perfect. Now, don't, don't stop there with that particular project. That particular project has tons of legs to it. If you click it, this is what one of the, um, the food for thought layouts that I created when I was messing around with the elements for this. And in the end, we actually have this one made, it's beside me. And it's a backlit dad's garage sign. Turned out really well. It's, um, it's two pieces of wood, obviously. It's mahogany and a piece of oak, I believe, is the background. An old piece of um, um, countertop that was just kind of kicking around. But how do you back? This, I'm sorry. How do you backlight it? Well, the beauty of this, Ted, is that um, it's a bit of a cheat, actually. If if you were watching or not as you were watching, but as, as you were seeing these go through the the um, the project that I did with the Michigan Maker sign, the tooling for that wasn't very optimized at all. There was lots of flat areas that we definitely could have used a, a pocket for. We could have cleaned that all up and made it way faster than what it was just doing basic 3D tooling. In this case, what we decided to do was not to use this model for the background. We actually recreated the model, and you you actually showed this earlier to, um, tonight when you showed the the edge treatment. This is just a V carve bit. Mm -hmm. so we used a simple V carve bit, pocketed out the center, drew some new vectors over top of this model. We didn't use the model, and we cut that back out super fast. There's a pocket in here that follows the shape of the dad's garage, but doesn't go the full depth of this recess here. So there's a bit of a I guess a shelf that this sits on. And in behind that, there's a gap. And so I fed the lights through the back of it and just hot glued them to the back of the, the car. And there's a, a couple of rare earth magnets that hold it in place in case I had to replace the, um, the, uh, the LED lights back there that I bought from the local dollar store. So it was a, it, this was super cheap to make. Like That was all repurposed wood and then a, a string of dollar store LED lights. And the effect is brilliant. It looks really good in the end. Yeah, it does look nice. And, and the, to be, believe it or not, it took two hours to cut that from start to finish. And it's almost two feet wide. Um, actually, I can show you. Sir. I forgot. Some of you guys will be able to see this, but some won't be able to. So that's it right here. Um, turn it on. There it is. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it turned out really nice. There's a bit of a gap. I can't see it. There's a gap underneath there. Oh, yeah. Well. So, yeah, so that's that. That's that. So don't let the, the, the you know, these projects, look, they do look simple at first, but as you kind of look at the potential of them, there is lots of potential in these projects as you look at them. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the basic thing to use these model projects on their own, with the exception if you wanted to make that backlit sign, you'd be making some of your own vectors and so on. And one thing I wanted to do for you guys and was to, to, to leave you with something that you could make um, on your own if you wanted to. So what we're going to do is when I was younger, we had on the table a peg game. We called it high Q. I don't know if you guys ever you guys know what that is, high Q. I'm sure that I think that actually, Ted, you had mentioned they're at the Cracker Barrel or something like that in, in the U.S. somewhere. Is there... Yeah, they have on the Cracker Barrel, they have those uh, golf bags. They're just golf tees, and it's like a 
triangle and you jump the jump the peg goals. Exactly. So we loved this when I was growing up. It was great. And so I decided to create this um, back in 2013 for my family, and we love it still. And it sits here on on my shelf. We use it on occasion now, not as often as we used to. Um, but I wanted to make one that I could that we could use. It had a 3D element to it and use some traditional woodworking, not CNC the whole thing. I wanted to kind of have some fun in my shop, um, my tiny shop at night. Um, and so that's what I can. I was going to play a video in a second, so I'm not going to talk during the video because I think that might break up. So there you go. So that's the that's the result of that. Is I wanted a place to be able to keep the you know the, the game be compact, could be displayed and look nice with the Celtic artwork on the top, but also when you're playing a game, you wouldn't lose the little pins. You could throw them back in the box when you were done. The way this one works is I I figured out how to cut those little pegs so that when you turned it upside down, it fits in there nice and flush, you know, sitting on the tops of the pegs. Um, but this isn't about doing any woodworking. This is about actually using your CNC to make something. So on my plane flight back um, from South Carolina on Sunday, I quickly drew out a quick sketch of this all done on the CNC. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to do, is just fly through this and see if I can uh, do this and using some, not only just 3D modeling, but also using VCARV desktop pockets and profile cuts to cut out one of these boxes. And then what I'm going to do in the end is I'm going to cut it on my machine, obviously not tonight, but over the, over the week I'll cut it. And then um, I want to give you guys the plans for this, the 2D vectors. The, the relief I'm going to use for the top of it is already free. So you can build this on your own if you want to cut it. Or you can make it your own by putting some of your own clip art on the top of it, maybe a, a deer or a fish or whatever you want to have at the fishing camp whatever it happens to be. The only thing I'm not going to show you how to do is how to cut those darn pegs the right length because that's really painful to do. So this can all be done in VCAR Pro or Desktop or Aspire, but cannot be done at all in, in Machinist. You could do the version that I made back in 2013 with the help of Machinist, but not this one at all. So guys, this could this could get really hairy. So let's just see how this is going to go. Close this. Let's bring up a brand new eCarve desktop. Let's create a new file, and we're going to make this. Um, I have I, I, in front of me. I have that sketch that you saw, so I'm just looking at the sketch, and um, we, I also have a, the digital version of the sketch that we can bring up if we need to. Uh, if I need to show you what I'm thinking. Actually, let's look at that to start with. So. This is my really poor sketch. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a box with a little bit of a ledge in it. That's going to be a, a two pocket cuts. And then we're going to pocket out two little finger holes so you can get your fingers in there to take the top off or put it back if you have to. And then we're going to use a profile cut to cut out the base. Pretty basic stuff. We're also going to make sure that we radius the inside edges of these so that our tool will we'll clean it all out and not leave any sharp corners and make a mess or try to make sharp corners. As you know, you can't make sharp corners because your tool's round, so it's not going to work. So we're going to radius those properly for that. And then we're going to create the top. And the top is going to be a 2D job, or no, sorry, two-sided job, excuse me. Um, I'll use the array copy tool to, to create the, the grid of, of holes. And then we're going to use uh, the uh, the drill tool path to drill out those holes. Then we're going to flip it over. On the back side, we're going to put the Celtic artwork. It's not that complicated a job, but again, it's one of those jobs that you can make over and over again. And you know, great gifts, lots of fun. Every guy's bar needs one. Every family needs one on their table to have some fun with. It should be great. So let's just go ahead and I'll slide that over here. So I got three monitors, so I'll put it on a monitor. So we're going to go ahead and make this a single side. Now, this is 
the way I normally work a job like this is I create a top-down view in my VCarve Pro or Aspire, or whatever I'm using, and then I'll pull out the bits that I need into two other files. That way I can make sure everything jives properly, it's just the way I work. So we have a single-sided job. We're going to create this. It's going to be a five by five. It doesn't matter what the thickness is because I'm never going to use this to machine apart. This is just to draw vectors. That's it. It doesn't matter where my datum is or anything. I'll put the datum in the center because it makes it easier to draw. And I'm going to click OK. So the first thing I want to do is create that grid of um, peg holes. So we're going to draw first little circle. And it's going to be uh, in the somebody's use use a little dialog here. It's going to be in the center of my job, and I'm going to make the diameter of it um, a quarter inch plus a little, because what what I had to do with my my pins before is I had to actually sand them down so they fit nice. So I thought if I made the holes a little bigger, I might not have that problem. So I'll make them slightly bigger than the quarter inch dowel I'm going to use for these, and we're going to go ahead and create that one. We're going to close that. So we've got one of those guys already there. Let's select that, and let's go over here, and we're going to use our array copy tool. Click that, and it automatically grabs the size of my selected object and puts it in my object size spot for me. So that makes it easy. I know that with my little my handy drawing I have here, I need seven rows and seven columns, and then I'm going to delete out the ones in the corner I don't need. Let's just go ahead and create seven by seven. And I'm going to put a gap between each of these to be a quarter inch, about the diameter of my actual dowel that I'm going to use for my pin. And we're going to group those together because I want to move them all at once, so I may as well just group them up. Do that. Close that down. Let's select that, and we're going to drag it to the center of our job. And there we have our array of holes. For Okay, we're going to right click on that and we're going to ungroup those because we want to delete some of them. Unselect them and we're going to go ahead and we're going to delete those ones in the corner. Now a little top tip for you, you guys might know this already, that selecting from your upper left to your bottom right will select all of the, com all of the vectors that are, that are fully encompassed inside of that box. So if I do this, the only one that I want to select is that one little circle. If I go from the bottom right to the upper left, anything that I touch gets selected. Okay, that's a good little tip for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete these guys, delete these guys, and now I have my set that I need to have. Select those all, right click on them, and let's group those up. We're ready to roll. Now, to get the right size of my lid I want, I want it to be, um, a certain distance from the outside edge of these. So what I'm going to do is figure out what, I don't know what the dimension of this thing is. I don't know how big that is right now. I'm going to press select that and press T on my keyboard and that'll give me the set size dialog. So now I can tell how big that is. It's point, uh, 3.32. That's great. Let's close that. Down. I just need it for that dimension. Let's create a box from the center. That's going to be 3.32 square. Create that and close that down. So now all of my, my box now is going to work off this box, the bottom of this box, and it's going to work off this one little box I have. So let's take this and we're going to offset this a quarter inch. Okay, out we go. Oh, sorry, in, I went inwards, my mistake. Uh, outwards. Delete that guy. Perfect. Okay. And we delete this guy. We're done with him too. Don't need him anymore. We're done. I'm going to grab this outside vector, and I'm going to go ahead and fillet the corners of that. And I'm going to fillet the corners of that, the radius of my tool, so that way I don't need to worry about it leaving any crap behind. It's going to actually going to do what it needs to do, get all the material out of there. Let's radius that, quarter inch, a normal fillet. And if I hover over top of the corners of this box, I can just fillet those real quick. So I'm very safe now when I go ahead and cut those. It's not going to be a problem at all. Close that down. Now, that's great. So what I'm now going to do is, this is the, is the size of my top. But 
I want the hole that's in the top of my bottom to be slightly bigger than that so that it doesn't, I don't have to jam it in there. Now, of course, I'm probably going to find out that when I sand this down, it's going to get small anyway, but in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to design it into it where I might in the end not, but we'll, we'll have to see when I cut it, what happens. So let's offset that outwards 0 0.02 of an inch. That way I'm ensured that I can actually fit this back in the top of my box. So now we're starting to build the actual box, the bottom of this thing. So to make life easier for all of us, I'm going to go ahead and do some layer organizing here. So I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to call this new layer base. And we're going to give it a color of, uh, let's go with orange. And we're going to go ahead and take this outline here right click on that and move that to the layer called base and now it's orange so now i can keep track of my vectors and where everything is let's take this line and i'm going to go ahead and offset this out the thickness of the upper lip of my box so what i'm doing is essentially you know defining this lip right here and i'm going to make that a quarter inch outwards Close that. Oh, and then we're gonna we're gonna select this inward one again, and we're gonna offset that in about 0.125, which is half the diameter of my tool, which I'm hoping that's gonna be enough. Offset that inwards, and we're almost done creating all the vectors we have to create for the bottom of our box. Not too complicated. Let's create a brand new box here, and this is gonna be for our finger hole. So if I start a box and I hold down my Alt key, it'll actually grow it out from the center of that. I'm going to make this about, I'll make it an inch tall. That's fine. That works for me. Apply and close. And I overshot the edge of this so I don't leave any tool radius behind when I go to pocket that out. That'll make sense in a minute. And again, we're going to select this. I'm going to hold down my control, my shift, and my H key, and it's going to copy it to the other side of my job. So again, um, H flips it horizontal, shift flips it across my center point, control makes a copy. So if I hold all those down, Everything works out quite nicely. So there we have all the vectors we need to create this little game we're going to make. At least I hope. Again, not cutting it could get a little weird. So we're going to go ahead and select all the vectors for the base. So we can do that by just dropping this down. And we're going to hide the, the, la the layer one, which is the top of our lid. And we have just our base vectors. And I'm going to copy those. I'm going to create a, bring up, open up a brand new copy of vCarve. I could have done it in that copy, but I really want three files in the end. I want my working file, my top-down view. In case anything goes wrong, I know where I've gone wrong. I want my, um, my box or my base file, and I also want my top file. So I've got three files. I can always go back and fix things if I need to, which is great. So create a new file. This one here is going to be um, five by five again, and I'm going to make the thickness of my material 0.125. In order to get that, I'm going to need to glue up some stock to make it happen, but that's okay. I figure that's a pretty good number to go with. Uh, I'm going to zero off my material surface, start in the center like I always do, and we're going to use the very high resolution. Okay. Let's paste that in there. And here we have our vectors to start off with our job. So let's go ahead and create the tooling for this. Bring out our tool paths, tile that so we can make sure we, we're doing what we want it to do. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this vector here and I'm going to pocket down the thickness of my, uh, my game top so that when I put it together, it's going to sit flat inside there and look quite nice, nice and flat. Let's create a quick pocket tool path. We're going to start at zero. We're going to go down a half an inch. I'm going to use my end mill to do that. We're going to do an offset. So it's going to start from the middle and work its way out. Depending on what you're comfortable with, you might want to do a raster. And we're going to go ahead and calculate that. Let's preview that. And there we have our first layer. It's going to be our lip is going to be right here on the edge of that. That's great. Close that down. Let's go ahead and select our second one. So now we're actually going to pocket the middle of our game where we're going to throw our pegs in when we're done with them. Just 
pocket tooling. We're going to go ahead. We're going to start at 0.5 this time, and we're going to go down another 0.5. Because what I'm going to do is when I actually make the holes for my um, pegs, I'm going to go in a quarter inch, and I'm going to hang my peg out a half inch. So that's going to end up giving me a peg length of three quarters of an inch. I figured that was a good round number. Use an end mill, it's going to take four passes, all this is fine, let's just go ahead and calculate that. Let's preview the visible tool path. There we have it. So far so good. Let's just go ahead now and pocket out our two finger holes. Let's pocket those, we're going to start at zero, go down a half inch, use our end mill again. May as well just do a raster on these ones, calculate those. Let's preview the visible tool paths, and we'll see what we have. There we go. And then our last tool path to cut this box out is going to be our actual profile cut. And in this particular case, I've had some, some hit and miss luck with this, is that if I use tabs, then I end up getting dwell marks where my tool goes across and raises up and goes down and keeps going on my particular machine. So it, they're hard to clean up the sides. So, um, and dwell marks for those that the people don't know is when, you're, when your tool stays in one spot too long and ends up cutting away at, at something you don't want it to. So what I would do in this particular case is I would double-sided tape this to my, my table and I would, wouldn't use tabs at all. Um, but I'll leave that up to you guys to decide how you want to deal with that. Let's just go ahead and do a quick profile cut. We're going to start at zero and we're going to go down to 1.25. Works out well. Use our end mill. Outside that, no tabs. And we're going to calculate that. Let's preview that visible tool path. And we may as well just double click on this waste material so we can see what we have. There we have a nice little box set up. You know, for easy tool paths, your machine should be able to cut this no time at all. Now, also, you might decide that there's actual quicker ways to do this, which would, might be to actually um, cut this middle middle section out with a profile cut right through your material and then stick a piece of material to the bottom. That way you're not doing all of that um, pocketing, which might take time. But for me, I don't mind my, my machine running. This is perfectly good. Save those off, and we can go ahead and run those. That's pretty easy. Let's go ahead now back to this and let's go and create our our actual peg top. I'm going to copy these and we're going to start a new instance of vCarve for my third file. Create a new file. In this case, we're going to change the width of this to be six inches. I'm going to use a double-sided job. And why I wanted to make it a little bit wider is because I need a place to put my two dowels that I'm going to end up machining through the material into my, my spoil board so I can make my flip when I want to do that. We're going to, our thickness of material is going to be 0.5 of an inch. Inches. We're going to have a zero off the top of our board, which is fine for both sides of this. And we're going to flip um, left to right. It doesn't matter so much in this case, but we're going to flip it left to right. Don't you want it to be a square? Pardon me? Don't you want it to be a square? Yes, I do. Yes. Height Y needs to oh, be no, no, six. Okay. No, it doesn't need to be because actually I want it to be longer than it is taller. It doesn't matter. Sorry. No, it's no problem. No, it's all right. Um, and the reason why I want that is I need that extra material because if not, when I put that, those two extra dowels in there, those dowel holes, it will encroach in on my actual um, lid and um, it cuts funny. I'll actually cut the tops off my dowels. I only know that because I wanted to test this flip before I talked to you guys and I did run it in a square um, five by five box. And it didn't work. Um, and also something to, to remember about um, VCarve Pro, Aspire, and Desktop is they all work on the same um, rendering engine, and it's a pickle, pix, not a pickle, a pixel-based render, rendering engine. So if you have extra space that you're not going to use, you're wasting pixels. And so when I put a 3D relief on this, I want to have the pixel density of my project to be as much as I can have so I get the most detail I can out of the relief that I put in there. 
Um, and in this particular case, if I made it six by six, I'd be losing two inches, or no, sorry, an inch, a half inch on top, a half inch on the top, half inch on the bottom of pixels that will never get used. And so I may as well keep everything as dense as I can so I get a really good um, carving out of that. And if you're a professional modeler like I am with making relief models, pixel density is important, much like when you're taking a photo and you're scanning it into your computer, DPI is really important. So it's the same sort of deal. So in this case, but thank you for pointing that out to me because it easily could have been an error. And that's all good. So we'll flip it top to bottom. That's great. And we're going to always make sure, because I'm actually going to use a bar relief model on this, I want to have the highest resolution I could have. And click OK. Let's paste that in. And there we have it. And we're good to go. So this is going to be the top of my box. I'm going to machine this first. And then I'm going to flip it over and put my relief on the other side. So we're going to create a circle because I need to create the dowel holes for this. And I'm going to use a quarter inch dowel and I want them to be tight. So I'm going to make it a quarter inch. If I have to modify my dowel, I will, but I'm not going to worry about that. Let's create that. And I have right here, although it's hidden in there now, a dowel here. It's great. So I'm going to move it out to the side. And I'm going to go Control Shift and H again, copy it to the other side. So what I'm going to do is the first operation I'm going to do is I'm going to drill those dowel holes through. Then I'm going to do the rest of my drill holes. I'm going to pick it up, put my put my dowels in the side, flip it over, and push it back into my waste board. So that way I know it's been flipped properly and it's on the right. Or I guess I'm doing front to back, same deal. I know it's going to be lined up perfectly. So. Now, just to finish the design, we must do all the design work at once. We're going to go ahead and work on our other side of this project. We're going to right click on this line. I'm going to make a copy of it to my other side. The nice thing about this, if you guys have worked with two sided projects, when I flip to the other side, then in all of the vectors that are on the other side of my project are now green and I can't select them. And I want to use this as my profile cut because I want to cut after I do my 3D tooling. I don't want to cut beforehand. I want to cut it after. Let's go to our clip art tab. And we're going to go to our design and make tab. And like I had said, if you sign up for a for free design and make it account, you can download the um, design and make machinist starter pack, which is all of these models here. The A version, the B version, and the C version you can download for free. It's kind of an eclectic mix of stuff, but it's uh, it's still kind of neat. There's lots of flowers, a little Noel ornament that you can make, which is kind of nice. And of course, at the very bottom, there's the Celtic knot work that I put on the box that um, that you saw in the video. Let's just double click on that and bring that in. I want it to be the C version, or the B version, excuse me, because I want it to be below the surface of my material. And let's just go ahead and select that and size it down to fit inside of my box top. Looks pretty good to me. I think that's all right. Doesn't need to be too exact. Now, as I showed you before, if you remember a while ago, is that we need to make sure, because this is the dish shape, we need to put in that zero plane in there. Make sure it's there for us so that we don't fall off the edge of our model. And we're going to go ahead and create a quick vector outline of that. So we can isolate our tooling to that thing. There we go. So all of our vectors are created. Everything's ready to roll. Let's go back to the other side of our job. And let's start making our tool paths. Bring it up. Here we are. Let's tile that. Um, you can see in the 3D view, you can see my Celtic knot work. That's because there's an icon here that's been turned on. So I can see both sides of this project at the same time. I, that confuses me, seeing as there's not a relief on both sides of this. So I like to turn that off so I can see the one side only that I'm working on. Let's select these two dowels. I'm going to go ahead and use my um, drilling toolpath. Select that. I'm going to start, my start depth is going to be at zero, and I'm going to go down 0.75. So I'm going to machine through my material into my spoil board. Use my quarter inch end mill. I'm going to use uh, my peck drilling so I can get some of those chips out of there so I don't bung up my tool. And we're going to go ahead and calculate that. And it's going to warn me that I'm going too deep. 
that's okay. I know I'm going too deep, so I don't mind. That's perfect. Click OK. Preview that visible tool path, and I should be able to see through those holes. And I can. Perfect. Close that down. Let's go ahead and select our other holes, our other our, our peg holes. Do the same operation. We're going to use the drilling tool path again. We're only going to go down a quarter inch. Like I'd said before, these I'm going to go. My peg should fit in a quarter inch deep. That leaves me a quarter inch of material for my other side for my relief to fit into, so I won't bust through and have holes in my relief. Um, and means that I need to have a dowel of three quarters of an inch long. Let's calculate that. Preview the visible or preview that tool path, and I've got my holes. Everything looks great. Run those tool paths. Like I said, take it off my machine bed, push my dowels in, flip it over, plug it back into my table again, and off we go to the other side, do the other bit. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a quick roughing pass. Use this vector. We're going to use a quarter inch end mill. We're not going to use any boundary offset. I don't want it to go over top of that edge like in the other previous demo I did. Do that zero. We're going to leave a little bit of an allowance behind. We're going to use a 3D raster. We're going to calculate that. We should preview that. And that should be exactly what I expect. Didn't remove. Oh, you know what I didn't do? And I better go back and do it, is I didn't change the shape height of this actual um, model. So I have no idea how deep it's going. Let's just go ahead and select that. Let's look at our properties. So I have a quarter inch of material. I'm, I'm, I'm drilling in the other side a quarter inch. And I have a quarter inch of material on the other side of my, my piece of wood. I can't definitely go down a quarter inch. Because if I did, then I'm going to start seeing drill holes through here. I don't want to go down too, too close because if um, if it gets too thin, I could break through. I don't want to do that. So let's just go down point one eight. And what that'll do is it gives me more relief. Again, getting the best bang for my buck out of the material that I have. We'll close that. And let's just go ahead and redo that roughing pass again. Let's, pre let's reset my preview and let's preview that visible tool path. And that looks just like it did a minute ago, but that reminded me I needed to go back and fix that. Let's close that, do a quick finishing pass. This time I'm going to use my um, 1 16th ball nose end mill. I want to get in there and get all the stuff out of there and make it look really sharp. So I'm going to select a different tool. And me being Canadian on the east coast of Canada, I work in millimeters and I I have a tool here that's a, a ball nose 0.04 of an inch, um, which is a mirror of my um, my one mil tool. So I think that's pretty close. So we're going to click OK. No boundary offset. We'll calculate that. You know, we're actually going to use an offset tooling. Step over retract. Like I said before, we're going to use that. Calculate that up. Although it's a teeny tiny tool, it's going to take a little time to do it, but I don't mind doing that because my end result is going to be beautiful in the end. So let's take a look and we're going to preview that visible tool path. Cleans up nicely, like really nice. I'd be quite happy with that. Let's go ahead and do our last piece of tooling, which is going to be this guy right here. We're going to do a profile cut. So we're going to cut right, cut our part out. I'm using, um, like we know, I'm zeroing off the top of my material. So what I could do is I could double -side, put double-sided tape on this before I stick it over and jam it down so I wouldn't need to use tabs. Um, but in this case, I'm going to use tabs just because. I'm going to change it up. Uh, we're going to go with the profile cut. Start depth is going to be zero. We're going to go down the full half. If you have my spoil board of my machine is um, plastic. I really don't want to go down very often and hit it if I can avoid it. So. Um, I do sometimes we'll put down a piece of material on top of that as a spoil board, an extra spoil board. So some people would overshoot this by like 0.1 or 2 so that you can go right through. But I'm not going to leave it at half. Use my end mill outside that. 
Uh, I'm going to use some tabs. Edit my tabs. I'm going to add in four tabs. Add those tabs again. Pcarve tries to make a good decision on where it wants to put those. But I'm going to change it up. Close. And let's just go ahead and calculate that. Preview my visible tool path. And there we have the other side of this. Now, to be sure that everything's jiving before I run this, I want to make sure that both sides are happy. Right now, if I turn this over, there's no holes on the other side, so I don't know if this is happy. I can go ahead and preview all sides. Let's reset my preview, and let's preview all of my tooling on both sides of this. And now I'll flip this over. Everything shows up. I know I haven't cut through my my relief on the other side and everything looks looks pretty nice super happy with that that's good so that's the, that's the third file let's go back to my powerpoint for a sec let's play on that so what i'm going to do like i said before is i'm actually going to cut this on my machine and then provide Ted or you guys all with the actual 2D tooling for this. So you'll be able to cut it yourself if you want to. Once I verify everything's happy. Um, I would love it if you cut it. I'd love it even more if you would take it and add your own spin on it. Add your own relief to it. Add some V-carving. Make it special to you. Maybe even put some V-carving in the bottom of the box. I don't know. Put some, make the, the bottom of the box double-sided so you can put a name on the bottom or put another piece of relief on the bottom of your box. I'm not really sure, but whatever you do, I'd love to see that. So I want to give that to you guys. It will be ultimately released on the Design to Make site, but probably not for months. So you'll have it way before then. You can fiddle around with it, play with it. Um, and don't forget that the Celtic knot that, that I used is free. So go ahead and get use that. Or use content that you already have or that you make on your own. That would be great. If you do use it, make sure you share it. I would really, really like to see it. So put it on the, uh, on the Vectric User Forum or put it on Facebook and just make sure you tag Design and Make It in it or put it in your Michigan uh, CNC um, Facebook page and uh, just tag me in it, Todd Bailey, and I'll see it. And, uh, and we'll either share it maybe if you'd like me to or give you credit or whatever it happens to you. But I would love to see it, the bottom line, is I'd just love to see you guys use it. And, you know, thanks. I know you guys are all um, seasoned users of V-Curve, so you probably didn't get much from that. You guys have been around for a while. But if you picked up one or two little tips, that's great. I really appreciate it. Well, I can't hear you, Ted. You're all sh your, your sound is shut off there. I said I picked up a half a dozen tips. I, I think you did a really excellent job, and we appreciate you taking the time to uh, out of your evening to uh, volunteer to uh, – give us some uh, insight on design and make and this project and like uh, Todd said uh, when we get the files I'll uh, share them with everybody and uh, and you'll get a chance and and I hope that uh, if you don't have a CNC or you want to get together with somebody and have a shop visit we can you know we can do that too great perfect excellent perfect well I think this is uh we'll close it out and we thank you so much for uh, spending your time. I just want to remind uh, people if uh, they see this and it's recorded later and they don't belong to uh, this webinar uh, series we do at the first Tuesday of every month at seven o'clock. And my email is T-G-A-U-T-H-I-E-R at Comcast.net. And you can send me an email and we'll get you on the list. So thanks again, Todd, and uh, I think that's the end of our webinar for this month. Thank you.